When Jesus got word that John had been arrested, he returned to Galilee. He moved from his hometown, Nazareth, to the lakeside village, Capernaum, nestled at the base of Zebulun and Naphtali Hills. This move completed Isaiah's revelation. Land of Zebulun, land of Zaphtali, road to the sea over Jordan, Galilee, crossroads for the nations. People sitting out their lives in the dark saw a huge light. Sitting in that dark, dark country of death, they watched the sun come up. This Isaiah prophesied revelation came to life in Galilee the moment Jesus started preaching. He picked up where John left off. Change your life. God's kingdom is here. Walking along the beach of Lake Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, later called Peter, and Andrew. They were fishing, throwing their nets into the lake. It was their regular work. Jesus said to them, come with me. I'll make a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. They didn't ask questions, but simply dropped their nets and followed. A short distance down the beach, they came upon another pair of brothers, James and John, Zebedee's sons. These two were sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their fish nets. Jesus made the same offer to them, and they were just as quick to follow, abandoning boat and father. From there, he went all over Galilee. He used synagogues for meeting places and taught people the truth of God. God's kingdom was his theme. That beginning, right now, they were under God's government, a good government. <laughs> Why is that so funny? I don't know. <laughs> That was the message, <clears throat> the message translation, by the way. All right. <laughs> Love that. You might have said that, Tom. I'm just reiterating it. You ever wonder what the reaction of the Father was in our scripture today? I'm often called Jesus Fishing for Men. <laughs> Cheesy title, I know. I mean, can you imagine? It's the morning, you know. The sun's showing its first hint of light and the roosters are crowing and a father and his two sons stir and they shake the, the sleep from their eyes and they're about to go do what they do every single morning. They, they're going to go and fish and they're going to make their livelihood on the waters with their nets and they're hopefully catching some big fish that can get them some high market prices, maybe to help them live another day. I like to imagine him laughing and talking, you know, a father having a good time with his two boys, you know, mending the nets, as we are told, as the boat sits in the, in the shallow waters. And then out of nowhere, this fella, this fella comes along, right, with two others now trailing him. And he stops at the shoreline, and he probably watches these guys in the boat and laugh and tell their fish stories, you know, before they head out. And he yells to them, hey! You two brothers, come with me and I'll make you a new kind of fisherman. One that fishes for people instead of fish. I'm sure at this point the father's like, oh, okay, don't look. Here are the crazies I've been warning you about. Just ignore them and he'll go away. Fish for people? What the heck is he, splash, splash? Before the father, Zebedee, can finish his sons, his kids, his sons. They're already wading off into the water, abandoning him in their boat without even looking back. And off they go, following Jesus into some new, unfolding, strange journey to preach about the kingdom of God. 
Now, I'm not sure I'd be too happy <laughs> if I was Father Zebedee. You know, would you be happy? You wonder, like, what the heck's going on here, right? For who knows if you ever saw his sons again. We're never told in the rest of the scriptures. But at least in this case, at least in this case, he was still around, the father was still around to bring the nets back home <laughs> that his kids had abandoned <laughs> to be used again sometime when, you know, he had to go fishing the time arose. That can't be said for our first calling story here. Think back to the first one for a moment, kind of reverse in order, which to me is actually the more shocking one of the two, and if we can use that word, the calling of Simon, Peter, and Andrew. So Jesus comes along to them first, and it's just the two of them. He does the same thing. He calls them. He says, hey, drop your nets and follow me. Come on with me and fish for people. And they immediately do, we are told, as they simply drop their nets or abandon their nets, just leaving them and walking away. They just left their nets. Off they go. Now, why is this more shocking than leaving your old man? <laughs> One, I think your old man could probably fend for himself, right? But again, at least the Zebedee brothers had a father to take their priceless nets back with them. But for Simon and Andrew, they just left them. They left them tools that made a living, that fed their families. They left them tools that for the poorest of the poor, which is what fishermen were, and it's time that would have been irreplaceable. Tools that they would actually carefully mend and daily repairing them or restrengthening them because buying or making new ones was never going to be in a budget. You never were going to get new nets. Not in this society. But they just drop them. <laughs> Poof, and they're gone. A favorite commentator of mine, Luke Swanson, uses a story, speaking of this, of his grandfather who was a carpenter and who cherished his tools and especially his hammer, this old hammer he had that he knew like the back of his hand. He talks about his grandfather letting him borrow the hammer one time and how he first made the young Luke know how important it was, how special it was to his craft and to his living. So Swanson writes, I try to imagine a circumstance under which my grandfather would leave his tools out in the rain. I cannot imagine one. Yet Simon and Andrew abandoned their nets Nets they would have known as well as their children. End quote. I think you get the point, right? This story told early in the church lectionary year, here it is January, it's no cute <laughs> bring a friend to church text <laughs> as it is often interpreted to be. I've seen churches say bring a fishing pole and a friend. <laughs> I have. I have. Like you're supposed to come in with a pole and a friend. Like you just lured them in, carried them into the church on a stringer, and said, sit there and listen to this message. <laughs> it's, it's not what this text is about. Rather, it sets the tone for Jesus' ministry as one rooted in the motif of the journey, or the way, as it's called, that, that has a beginning you heard early in the text, about Jesus picking up the mantle from John the Baptist, and it's also a story, a journey that has no end. The only certainty about this way is twofold. First, as our story illustrates, it is full of twists and turns that often people don't see coming. Ask Simon and Andrew or the Zebedee brothers. They just went out fishing and they end up on the journey of a lifetime. Who knew? And second, from the very beginning, Jesus did not call followers to follow him to believe certain things about him. You didn't hear that word once, did you? Not one time. No, he used the metaphor as he called them to come and fish, meaning an action verb. In other words, fishing for people, for Jesus, didn't mean to lure them in with, with beliefs. It meant to invite them into a movement whose path was always unfolding in new and unexpected ways, not in terms of belief, but rather in terms of the unfolding journey and, and more often than not a journey based in challenging the traditional status quo way of living in the world. Belief for Jesus, those were rigid and they were uninspiring. That's all over the Gospels. But a path to walk, a way to journey, a people to travel with and a whole lot of love and justice to spread, well, that was a hallmark of the enlivened spiritual life of Jesus and he called people to come and be a part of it. Unfortunately, 
I'll argue that has, that has been lost on so much of Christianity today, right? It's all about what for too many? Belief. It's all about belief, not about the way. And I believe that is highly unfortunate. I think that's why I resonated so strongly this past week with an image I saw. I came across a meme that I saw on Facebook and other, a whole bunch of other social media sites. It kind of went viral. I'm sure one of my show it, some of you have seen it. It's a meme of Jesus created by someone that, that depicts a newly returned Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting at a laptop, thank God it's a Mac. I'd like to think Jesus would be a Mac user if he came back, you know, I really do. He'd be like, PCs, no way, give me a Mac. And here he's drinking his first ever cup of coffee because they didn't have coffee in his time. <laughs> and he's looking completely shocked and mortified about what has been done to his good news, to the gospel that he espoused during his life. And the good news that he called people to join in on bringing to life in the world. A little, I cut the caption out on the, on the bottom. It, is, it says, uh, it said below his shocked and aghast face, it says, Jesus finally returns and gets his first look at what evangelicals have done to his gospel. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make that look up, can you? <laughs> oh, I mean, just look at that face. That was like me watching the Vikings lose to the Giants last week. <laughs> the Jesus of this meme is no doubt reading stories about how particular segments of Christianity have tra tra transformed and taken and transformed his message of love and inclusion into a weapon of fear and division. A big part of that being how his good news now has been turned into good news for some, right? Mainly those who believe a narrowly defined right thing about him, and bad news for others, those who do not confine easily to the threat of coerced beliefs and rigid judgmental doctrines of assent. I'm sure he is shocked by a bunch of things here. I mean, look at his face. One, he's shocked the fact he's no longer Jewish. <laughs> what do you mean, I'm, I'm what? I'm what? I'm something that didn't even exist when I was alive? I never heard of Christian. What? One of the calling, a little side note, one of the calling, Jesus calling the disciples images I was going to use that went around, also around on, on social media showed Jesus with a big cross calling the disciples. And I'm thinking, okay, someone's completely missed the historical context here. <laughs> Jesus wearing a cross. But anyway. So Jesus will be shocked right here. I'm sure this might be the first thing. I'm no longer Jewish. What? But more than that, shocked over how what was once called a way of life and a path to walk that was wide open to others had been abandoned in the minds of so many as a system of, of exclusion that is only for the select few that happen to share again those so-called correct beliefs. I mean, there's a big, big difference after all between these two coming questions here. One, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and, and all the beliefs that come with that? Versus, will you come in off the water, gather on the shoreline, and follow me on a path of love, inclusion, hope, and equity for all people, regardless of what they believe? Yeah. Door number two. <laughs> do you want to trade it? I have some interesting prizes if you'd like to trade that door number two. What's behind door number three? <laughs> I have a feeling Jesus would be closer to this meme and wouldn't quite see that first way reflected at all in what he was seeing, but rather he would see his way hijacked as a rigid, closed, cold, and uncaring faith versus one that calls people into the lives of the world and into the hearts of the people. Now I'll take door number two. I'll take that shoreline Jesus we heard about today any day, the one actually presented in the Gospels over the make-believe Jesus of rigidity, creedal purism, blind belief, and I think we can add white supremacy, right? And other things this day. I have a feeling many of you will join me in door number two. <laughs> you no, know, I look around today. I look around, and, I, and what a delight to see all these new members, you know? 
of the church, along with other new members and those who have been around here for a long time, all of you, you know, gathered here. And it makes me smile because I think together we are reclaiming that Jesus of the shoreline that called on people to follow his way, not to believe in him, but to follow him. And whether you just found us recently or been around since we were created as a church in 1959 or somewhere in between, I, I don't think most of us, most of you all come here because you want to believe the right things or be affirmed for holding the correct beliefs or the correct doctrines, right? Am I right on that? Yeah. I'm guessing that that number is pretty high. In fact, we, we don't even have any doctrines. <laughs> <laughs> We don't even have any doctrines here, except for love and hope. I think that's our only doctrine. We don't profess any creeds outside of compassion and inclusion. That makes me smile that we are a spiritual community rooted on a path that is, is always looking forward through love-colored glasses, looking to a new and compassionate future that is spreading fast, rather than through blinding creedal-colored glasses with a, within a system that is always looking back to an uncompromising past that is fading fast. I mean, when Jesus called Simon, who will later shed that name, he'll go ahead and become Peter. He called Andrew and the Zebedee brothers and soon many other women. I know history will tell you he didn't call women. Oh, yeah, he did. In huge numbers. And they followed him. And other men followed him. He didn't call them, hey, say, hey, come with me and look back. He called them to journey forward, to let go of the baggage of the past and and look forward towards a new way of spreading love in the world. That's how I see us right here. This place, looking forward, not lamenting the past and focusing on the past. That's why I think so many are finding their way here. Experience over belief, right? Love over hate, acceptance over judgment, action over apathy, inclusion over exclusion. Awe, awe and wonder over contempt, mystery over certainty, a thriving future over a dying past. And one big way, again, how we are doing that is by focusing on the fact that our faith should be a journey into newness and goodness and not a regurgitation of uninspiring and outdated doctrines and beliefs that just don't fire the spiritual imagination anymore. I think this is what Jesus was doing in his own time as he walked those shorelines seeking people to travel with into the new future that he envisioned. And I know that's what we are doing today as well on the shorelines of our own lives as we blaze a trail to a new spiritual future as a transformative spiritual community. I thank every one of you, every one of you, for being a part of that. You inspire me. And it's not just us. I always have to get this out there on New Member Sunday. This is my bragging moment about the UCC. But this denomination that many of you just joined, whether you know a lot about it or not, well, has this impressive list, list of firsts in history. And, and I love to repeat them. You've heard it, some of you have heard me say this 15 times. Others have never heard me say this. But it's worth repeating for those especially new to the United Church of Christ that, that in our past, we've been breaking new shoreline. We've been following Jesus on new shoreline for centuries for centuries, things like forming the earliest abolition work. Our denominations have that in its history, the earliest abolition work. We ordained the first ever woman to, we ordained the first ever woman to ministry, Antoinette Brown. That's in our history of our denomination. We published the first African-American poet. Awesome. And ordained the first ever African-American man or person to ministry in Lemuel Haynes. Or, or or through the advent of the first foreign mission boards and integrated, integrated anti-slavery societies. Think about that. First ever, and it's to these denominations that form the UCC. First ever school for the deaf, United Church of Christ denominations, and ordaining the first openly gay man ever in history, ever in history, openly gay man in Bill Johnson in the 70s. That was the United Church of Christ denominational first. And not only that, they even one time, they canceled the National Synod. And if you know what National Synods are, these are a big deal planned a year in advance. <laughs> and these are, you know, not my kind of thing, but some people, these, you know, polity wonks are really into this stuff. And so they plan and plan and plan. 
And then one time they just said, let's cancel it. And they all got on planes and buses and they headed to California and they marched with Cesar Chavez for farm workers' rights. That's the denomination, time and again. It's never really been about believing ever for this denomination, for us as a church, but also for denomination, but in how we follow Jesus on the shoreline and from the shoreline, how we journey on the path and how we engage the way of Jesus, that's what really has mattered. And I think we stand in a firm way in that tradition. Mm. To our newest members, all of you, wherever you are out there, I see you. <laughs> welcome, welcome. I'm so happy each of your journeys, your paths stop here at these doors in this time. I, I just hope you didn't leave a father <laughs> or some expensive, important equipment behind <laughs> to run here and join this church. <laughs> Go back and get them if you did. Seriously, we welcome you with open arms and are excited for you to share your own gifts and your own passions. Faith UCC needs you. We need you. This church needs you. This denomination needs you. They say when it comes to, to building power um, to make change that you need one or, of two things. Well, if you have both, that's great. But you need one or the other. You need money and you need people, right? Well, we don't have a lot of money. <laughs> but we are growing in power in our numbers. So welcome, friends. You're helping us build power. All of us together, together make this movement. New passions have just come in. Older passions, young dreams just coming in. And old dreams have been here for, for many years. We are all an intricate part of this movement of love and life. And I look forward to watching our power grow and our love flourish into this new year that we are still journeying into. So may our path be blessed. May our work make change, real change. May our journeys be peaceful. And may our love for the Jesus way, not beliefs in Jesus, but following the Jesus way, may that be a catalyst for good trouble in our community and in our world into this new year and into the year's to come. Peace be with you all and also with you. I'll take door number two. Amen and a woman.